What is going on there, gum fighters? This is a recast on body armor. I think more and more serious armed citizens, more well-regulated types, are considering body armor. So, I thought it was a good episode to put out again. Also, my body armor was recently stolen. You might know more about that if, you've, if you're a regular listener. But anyway, my body armor was stolen. So consider this a small organic GoFundMe. If you want to help raise some money to replace the body armor, there should be a Venmo link in the show notes. Now, as always, if you want to become a patron, I'd be blessed to have you as a patron. If you just want to give a few bucks to help buy some body armor, go ahead and click the Venmo link and give give whatever you think, you whatever is in your heart to give. And if you don't have it in your heart to give, then don't, and don't feel guilty about it. Give because you want to. This, this content is free to listen to. But if you want to help raise the money for some new body armor, that will be appreciated. Anyway, with that, enjoy this tactical reload of Gunfighter Life. Armor. Warriors in different cultures throughout history have been using armor for a long time. What about you as the modern gunfighter? Well-armed, regulated militia, Second Amendment, modern-day crusader. Is body armor right for you? If so, what kind? What type? That's what we're going to talk about today on Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about gunfighting the right way, with Judeo-Christian values and real-world first-hand experience. If you've listened before and liked the show, don't forget to scroll down, hit some stars, leave a review. With that, I'll put in the bio, and then we'll get into the main topic. So, who am I? Who is this person talking to you from across the internet? Why should you listen? First and foremost, I am a Christian, a servant of God, and a follower of Jesus Christ. God has blessed me to do many things in my life, for I could do nothing apart from him. U.S. Marine Corps combat veteran did a couple of tours in Iraq. As an assaultman after my combat tours, I was an urban warfare instructor for the Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. also did several years in law enforcement, LAPD. I worked regular assignments and more specialized assignments. I've been a private contractor for a three-letter government agency. That's all I'll say about that. Been blessed to be a state rifle and pistol champion. And West Coast Regional Rifle Champion won more shooting competitions with the talent that God's given me than I can actually remember. Was blessed to be the commander of a tactical team in a large metropolitan area. Our primary job, the reason we primarily existed, was to stop active shooters. I got the opportunity to head up and be the commander of that team. I grew up around guns, hunting and shooting and competing at a very early age. I've been blessed to hunt all over this beautiful country from whitetail on the east coast to mule deer on the west coast and bear and elk and all manner of things. I've even been a professional big game hunter and guide. But again, most importantly, I'm a Christian. And I am your host, Michael Melito. Welcome to the podcast. Now, I've been very blessed by God to make it through alive many different roles as a professional gunfighter. That's a big reason I started Gunfighter Life. I wanted to pass on real world first hand experience to you. Not theoretical, not like I put this stuff on and walked around my living room or I wore armor at a Renaissance festival once. Like, I wore it as part of my job to stay alive. U.S. Marine Corps, warring in Iraq, conquering, liberating, however you want to quantify that. I wore body armor for law enforcement, some regular assignments and some more specialized assignments. Also worked attached to some three-letter government agencies that, let's just say I've worn all kinds of different body armor. I've worn all kinds of different stuff. I've worn hard armor, I've worn soft armor, I've worn who knows how many different levels of body armor. Covertly, overtly, clandestine. I've run the standalone body armor with stuff attached to it. I've run the 
body armor with the clip-on chest rigs like the LBVs. I've run battle belts like legitly as a professional, not again, not just, and I do it in shooting competitions and stuff too, but not just that. Like I did it professionally as a professional gunfighter. Wore it as a private contractor. Worn it with the use of rifles and handguns and even grenades for that matter. Demolition. You know, all manner of things. So, I'm going to try and cover this with that real world first hand experience. So just know that. I'm not telling you have to agree with me, but I have... Who know? I would even hate to recall the number of miserable hours I've spent in body armor. And if I can pass some knowledge on to you guys, I mean, that's the point of the podcast, right? Minister to you and to serve you in many different ways. So let's get into different kinds of different types of body armor. Wearing body armor. As I mentioned, miserable hours. It's not just a leveling up thing, right? I, I'm not a gamer, but it's not like you just run across some body armor and put it on and now you're protected from shooting or getting hit in certain places with the rounds. That's, that's not real life. There is a legit cost that comes with that armor, and that cost comes in weight and mobility. There's always this equation as a warrior. Firepower versus mobility. Armor versus mobility. In the U.S. Army, it was in the 1st Cavalry. Now you have legit cavalry. Not talking about air cavalry. I'm talking about legit modern-day cavalry. Full battle tanks. Abrams. And you also have cavalry scouts. Why? Because firepower versus mobility. Those tanks, no arguing, they have a lot more, a lot more firepower and armor. But they don't have nearly the amount of mobility and speed of the Cav Scouts. That's why Cav Scouts exist. More mobile, maneuverable vehicles. Cav Scouts on foot, ground pounding with their Lamborghinis human body is amazing and it can go places that no tank will ever be able to go but cav scouts are a lot less armored and a lot less firepower than the cavalry that's just an analogy so which do you want to be there you put on body armor realize you're giving something up and you're giving up mobility i don't care how fast you can run how in shape you are if i strap the body armor is made up of different things but let's say for argument's sake i strap you down with a bunch of literal steel plates you're not going to be able to run as fast I'm blessed by God to be a good sprinter, but you strap body armor on me and I can't sprint as fast. That's just a realistic thing that you have to deal with. So I want to hit you in the face with a dose of reality before we get this started. Unless you plan on strapping on your body armor, sitting in a lazy boy, watching Netflix and just waiting at the door for some adversary to pop in, you got to take that into account. If you're wondering if you should get body armor, first I would submit to you, again, a slap in the face of reality. Can you run now? Can you run a couple of miles now? Can you sprint up a flight of stairs? Can you set up a very basic shooting drill where you shoot to sprint while you're reloading and then get to the other point and shoot to? Fitness as a warrior is far more important than body armor. I would rather be very fit and unarmored going into a modern day gunfight battle, whatever it is, than be totally out of shape and have the best armor. That's not a good trade-off. Not everything is fixed by a click of the button on Amazon. If you can't climb a flight of stairs, if you can't sprint a flight of stairs without armor, you probably don't want to add armor. Because armor, it's... Try and keep this show friendly, and I I know all manner of people listen. It's miserable. It's miserable. Especially talking about wearing it for days, weeks, months on end. That may not be you, but even wearing it for hours it's you're trading something you're not just getting something it's not all bonus is what I'm trying to tell you look at the amount of soldiers and cops that have back problems shoulder problems because of body armor they're not designed to walk around with giant steel plates or ceramic plates strapped to you like a turtle so just realize that going in I'm not telling you not to get body armor I'm telling you to do a cost benefit analysis it's not like a video game or TV where you just throw on the body armor. Then you play action movie for a couple of 30 seconds and then they say cut and then you take a break and 
Drink a nice Perrier. I don't know what actors do. I'm not an actor. Then you catch your breath and then the action and you bust on the screen again. This is real life. You might be stuck in this stuff for a long time. And wearing it is uncomfortable and miserable is the best word I can think to describe it. There's a finite amount of gear that you can carry as a man. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie Commando or a 125 pound barista working at Starbucks. There's a finite amount of combat load you can carry and still be combat effective. And you get to the point where you tip that scale of firepower versus mobility. And armor is only part of that. You still have to consider a weapon. Because if you're wearing armor, I assume you're armed. You have to consider the weight of the weapons platform, the weight of the ammo, the weight of other things. If you're talking about preparedness, survival. What about all the other stuff that adds up? The compass, the comm, the water procurement devices, all that stuff. So I'll give it some thought. Next, I'm going to get into, I covered, I've worn armor a lot of different ways, a lot of different configurations throughout the years. Now, you can have some pretty legit body armor and wear it and attach a bunch of your stuff to it. You could even attach your handgun to it, your rifle mags, your pistol mags, your medical kit, another part of the weight we didn't talk about. If you're wearing armor, you probably should have a medical kit, right? All that stuff you can attach to the body armor. A lot of modern body armor has molly some other maybe newer whiz bang thing I don't even know about for a long time Molly has been the standard you could attach all that stuff to the vest here's an advantage of that is it's simple you can just grab the body armor and put it on the big disadvantage is big disadvantage is if you want that stuff you either have to have a completely different kit set up with just an LBV or you have to just wear the body armor whenever you're doing tactical stuff decide that's the route you want to go also I talked about this this is hollywood you know maybe a gunfight has gone down like this in real life sometime i don't know i'm not talking about dueling here we're not talking about going out into the street high noon the clock strikes and then two men just mano a mano draw and shoot each other that seems rather foolish to me and if you can move around or get in a better position speaking of that running and getting in a better position is this body armor kind of does make you like a turtle of a med kit on your back and then a handgun strapped to your front. All your rifle mags and other stuff. More to gunfightings than just guns. What about getting in a prone position? About if you end up on your back? All manner of things. I don't just add the weight, but you start getting pretty bulky in my experience trying to add everything to body armor. Now, if you just want body armor, you just want, let's say, one spare rifle mag. You might make the argument that's the best system for you. The other system, and I've, I've done both of these, is to have your body armor, your system, whatever it is. And then you have an LBV, a load-bearing vest or something like it. And that's got all your kit on it. It's got your rifle magazines, your pistol magazines, your compass, your walkie-talkie, your med kit. And you can throw that on top of your armor and clip it. Or if you want to, if you decide, you know what, I'm going on a long reconnaissance patrol or I'm going on a long patrol. I don't want all this body armor. I think the firepower versus mobility equation is more in favor of me going light, light infantry, fleet o foot. Then you can just put on the LBV. You might have to tighten the straps, but you can have all that stuff and not have the armor. There's some advantages. There's some modularity there. Here's a big disadvantage, especially if you're doing dynamic movement and stuff. It can loosen up and wiggle around. So if you're trying to kit up in a hurry, it's just one more thing. Putting body armor on can take time. Putting body armor on and then putting an LBV on can take even more time. So think about that. It, does that matter to you? A truck kit where you're going to have to throw it on maybe really quickly. So that's going to take a lot longer than just having it on your armor. And lastly is the system that I prefer when I have the choice. And that is the battle belt setup. I've done a whole episode on battle belt. It was one of the very early episodes. Perhaps I should revisit it as everybody talks about these things now as if there's something new. But as somebody that's run them professionally, as a professional gunfighter, private contracting, as the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters, as a police officer working some of the nastiest streets in the country, LAPD, somebody that's worn a go-to fighting belt. That's my preferred system. I much prefer to carry stuff there on my belt 
a way to carry that weight with the most amount of maneuverability and restricts my movement the least. So my preferred method is a battle belt, whatever you want to call it. A battle belt, a war belt, a Minuteman loadout tactical fanny pack system. I, I don't care what you call it. I call it a war belt, a battle belt, either one of those. You get the concept that I'm talking about. A fairly robust belt, not like the one you wear in your jeans. Like a big robust belt. You Generally in these systems will have an inner belt and an outer belt. That's a whole other topic. But you have this big robust belt with some padding, some things like that. To it you attach your spare rifle mag, a couple of spare pistol mags, tourniquet, handcuffs, mission dependent if that applies to you. Things like that, right? Maybe a radio. It goes on the battle belt. And then you put on your body armor. I much prefer that system. If I want to just rock the battle belt, if I don't want armor, that's really nice. If I want to take my armor off, let's say it's a mission that requires armor, but it's a 48 hour mission, right? I don't want to have to wear my body armor. I can just take it off and still have the battle belt because if something happens, I'm still armed. If I'm, let's say, moving from place to place in a vehicle, I get in a black Suburban and I'm driving somewhere, I can take that body armor off for a little while, and then when I get there, I can throw it right back on and keep the battle belt ready. Keep positive control of my weapon and my ammo. I like that system. That is my favorite system. So if you're looking at a system, I would recommend you start there. And let's... I kind of jump right into this going into the hard armor. Let me back up. There's two real big categories of armor over and covert and then hard and soft usually usually there's exceptions right the old school flak jackets or things like that or some police units a lot of times soft armor like what a cop would wear is worn on the inside it's covert it's worn on the inside of a shirt a uniform a jacket and it's soft armor meaning it's pliable it's malleable if I say Kevlar, that's just because I'm old school and what I know is as if it's, you know, if it's spectra or carbon fiber nanotubes, I'm just probably going to colloquially refer to it as Kevlar. Just like I refer to things as a red dot site, even though it may not have a red dot, it may not either be red or a dot. It may be an orange triangle, but I call it a red dot site. I'm going to say that with like Kevlar body armor, so just know that it may not all be strictly speaking Kevlar. That kind of police soft body armor. When might you want to use this? Well, when you want to be covert. This is what traditionally you would think of as police body armor. Now, more and more, there's this militarization of police. When I was a cop working regular assignments, even a lot of specialized assignments, we would just wear this kind of armor. More and more, I see what I think are, let's call it general purpose police officers, patrol cops, beat cops, Wearing this hard armor, sheriff's deputies, whatever. They look more like a SWAT team. That's part of this whole militarization of police, which I don't want to go down that rabbit hole on this episode, but it is happening. But I'm talking about the more traditional, what you think of as a police body armor. And I'll liken this to when I was the commander of a tactical team. A lot of the times we wanted to be overt. We wanted to be a hard target, a visible deterrent to active shooters. That was our primary job to stop active shooters. Not always. I was in charge a lot of times. I would delegate it. But a lot of times, if it was a big mission, I would write, you know, an op order, an operations order. And I would have guys in different roles. A lot of times, you want to be that visual deterrent. Like, not on my watch. Not in this house. I'd have my guys in full kit, body armor, war belts, possibly rifles, like there's not going to be an active shooter here, and if so, he's going to be taken care of pretty quick. Sometimes I wanted my guys over, or a mix of the two, I would have scouts. Sometimes I would even play this role, or fulfill this role. But I would be there to observe. Observe and report to maybe a QRF, guys that I had at the ready that were in full kit. And depending on the mission, sometimes I might be in a three-piece suit. Armed. Sometimes I might have my guys in a hoodie and some beat up old clothes to blend in with the environment depending on what it was a big part of our job we were in a large metropolitan area that had a lot of big like a-list celebrities like the biggest of the big names 
and we would be with them, working with them, working with their people. Not because I think their life is any more valuable than anybody else's, I don't, but they draw giant crowds of people. And that's a tempting target for an active shooter. That's where we got involved. Depending on what kind of crowd it was, I might want guys in hoodies and jeans, or I might want them in three-piece suits. That soft, covert armor allowed you to get away with that in those kind of environments. There's a time and a place for that. Likewise, you, if there's like civil unrest in your neighborhood and you're there to bug out, do you just want to look like a family in a minivan? Maybe put on this soft armor and your CCW. Or do you want to get your, whatever the term in vogue now is for militia, the mutual assistance group together, rolling out in a convoy, in which case you might want to look like a hard target. There's a time and a place for both. So don't discount the soft armor. Of all the stuff I've ever used, by far, by far the best soft covert armor I have ever found is citizen armor. Now that I say that, I should look them up to make sure they're still in business, but just so much better than any other soft armor I've ever used. And they're not giving me anything to say that. Just I've used a lot of armor over my days. If I was choosing any soft armor that I'm aware of, citizen armor, absolutely. Now let's revert to what we were talking about before, the hard armor, which I think is what a lot of people are looking at when they're looking at armor. First, you got to put it in something, right? Unless you just plan on duct taping it to your torso, which I don't consider that a legit plan unless that's all you got. But you're going to need a way to carry it. Carry these plates. Those are called, logically enough, plate carriers. They carry armor plates. So if you're looking at plate carriers, now I have quite a bit of experience again with these. If you're looking for a bargain, you might look up some of the old U.S. Marine Corps ones. You might be able to get them cheaper, surplus or something. They are, in my opinion, one of the most uncomfortable ones, especially with that neck collar. Ugh. Of all the ones that I would actually recommend, there's a few. Now, when I was the commander of a team, you might think that's all cool operational stuff, and a lot of it was, and I really enjoyed A lot of it was desk work that I really didn't like doing, but I did because I loved my men. And I wanted to give them the best chance of survival. A big part of that was writing policies and what I would allow and wouldn't allow. And part of that was procurement, like what we were going to issue. We went through a lot of different body armor. That was kind of a headache. We were, and the number one I'm going to recommend just for the vast majority of people is the Cry JPC. The Cry JPC of all the overt body armor of all the plate carriers my number one recommendation for sure we tried at one point to go to the condors because they basically looked the same and were way cheaper i don't say this with any kind of joy but they all they all failed on us all the ones i that i know of that we issued out failed now we're not talking again wearing these around the living room or whatever i'm talking about Professional gunfighters that wore these for 8, 10, 12 hour shifts day after day. All the Condor ones failed. Now some of them we had like a seamstress that we could go to and they reinforced these because we had already bought them. And some of the guys opted to stick with those. Some of them got reissued other ones. But just know if you're going to wear them for a couple of hours, they're probably going to be fine. If you plan on wearing these day after day, hour after hour, mile after mile... The Condors, just none of them held up that I'm aware. Maybe some that we didn't issue, but I think every one that we issued broke, and they all broke in pretty much the same spot where the straps attach to the plate carrier, the, the section that holds the plates. They all ripped either wholly or partially there. The Cry JPCs, I don't know of any one of those that ever broke. So although they may look the same and it may look like you're getting a bargain, I really recommend the Cry JPCs. Another one... The 511s, the 511 plate carriers, they may make more than one model, so let me look that up. Let me pause this. The one I'm talking about basically just says 511 tactical vest ballistic plate carrier. Now these are really good vests with one caveat. They're kind of like those one size fits all socks. If you're the guy that those fit, that's awesome. That's never been me. Those one size fits most kind of socks, they don't fit me. These are meant for... I think people that don't actually wear them for long periods of time or they're really well made so they don't break down. That wasn't the issue. They're huge. Like if you're a giant hulk of a man and I'm, th I'm not talking like obese, like I'm talking about you're 280 pounds and well built 
and well-conditioned. The guys on the team that were like that, these were fantastic. They were really, really good. But for most other people, they're just too big to offer that mobility. Like It's kind of like a turtle shell. That's the one good thing about the JPCs. That's why I said if, if there's no other caveats, the JPC, they come in different sizes. And that's important, right? You don't want to be running around like a turtle. You don't want the vest to be so big that your head's like poking out of it. You want it to fit your vital organs and not much more if you want to keep that mobility. If you want these for like some kind of CrossFit workout, they may use these in CrossFit, I don't know. But like something like to condition and you want a bunch of different people to use it and for some kind of test or something, it might be good for that because pretty much anybody can throw it on. It's I would hate to see the person that this that was so big wearing body armor that this wouldn't fit. But there's a lot of the population that it's just way too big for. But the 511 plate carriers, if they do fit you, they're a good option. And I think they are cheaper than the Cry JPCs. Now, I would allow my guys to wear their own armor if it complied with the uniform policy, which I had to write. As long as it was like coyote brown or some very close color, they could wear it. If they opted for a different armor, different plates, as long as it was at least the level that we issued or better, they could wear it. And if they had another carrier, because they're wearing these things for hour after hour, day after day, and they liked one better, I was the kind of commander that said, yeah, if, if you want it, you buy it, you can run it. We had some other armors on the team. And I tried to look those up just from memory and give you those brands and stuff. But honestly, I'm not exactly sure. There's so many now. There's just like, it seems like the polymer striker fired handgun market. Like every week there's a new one. I don't want to give you the wrong scoop and tell you something's good when it's not. So you may look at those. Also, I'm a fan of the AR500 ones, the plate carriers, if you're on a budget. Now let's talk about the plates themselves. Kind of your military standard, your sappy plate. Now I'm not a body armor engineer, but the way these things generally work is you have a metal plate with some ceramic coating on it, and then you have some kind of outer protection for spalling, for shrapnel, for things like that, and to also protect the ceramic from busting. These things are almost like, of all things, the old school bathtubs. If you've ever seen those, they have like metal and then it's coated with ceramic. Ceramic dissipates energy pretty well when something hits it. The downside of that is it shatters. It should be contained in that outer shell and be protected but know that these things can break if you drop them. At least that's what we were told. I never broke one dropping it. Anyway that's kind of the military sappy plate. They are good if you can find those. If there's a, you know an organization getting rid of a bunch of those surplus they are good. They are thick. They basically have like the one cut. That's going to be your standard cut. They do make, there's probably a bunch of companies that make their own proprietary cut, but you may also commonly see what's referred to as a swimmer's cut, where it's got more of a cutout where the armpits are. And that's great for rifle work, for pistol work, for dynamic movement. So if you have the option, I'd say for sure swimmer's cut. Now the cheaper option is going to be your hard armor just steel plates air 500 just like you use as a target like when you're shooting and it stops the bullet it shreds the bullet just like the steel plates you hang they also make that air 500 or some other similar steel i'm not i'm not a metallurgist right but they make armor plates like that and a lot of people will just immediately discount these because they still shoot them and say oh but it fragments yeah okay maybe you got hit with a small piece of bullet jacket which is not ideal but the entire bullet was stopped. You hit, got hit with a small fragment, which I'd call that a win. And also a big problem, when they shoot these, they'll shoot them and you'll see in slow motion like all these fragments, but you're going to be wearing that inside a vest. So the vest is going to stop a lot of those things. And speaking from somebody, me, who has pulled multiple of those bullet fragments out of his face, hands, things like that, I'd much rather do that than get shot with a bullet. Speaking as somebody also who has been shot with a whole projectile, I'd much prefer just the flak, just the shrapnel. So if that's what you can afford, you may look at putting your own kind of coating on there if it doesn't come with one, but they are affordable. They do work. I don't discount those as fast as a lot of other people do. And there's all kinds of other technology that you may want to look up, but those are the big ones. Your sappy plates and your just metal plates. They make all kinds of cuts. They make different, they're bent in different ways. 
but maybe some minor steel variations are going to be AR500 steel. And after doing some more research and thinking about the names, I do think one of those brands was the Ferro Concept Slickster. I think the guys that had those really liked them. Do your own research on this stuff, but I think that was one of the ones that the guys really liked. Now let's talk a little bit about body armor levels. Now I really can't wrap my head around why they thought it was a good idea to name the body armor levels this way. It's kind of confusing. Level 2, level 3A, which you might think is better than level 3, but it's worse than level 3. Level 3, and level 3 plus, and then level 4. Why not just like levels 1 through 5 or 6, or if you're going to, I assume they made these and then they realized there was something in between, why not just go like 2.5 and 3.5? Very confusing, I think, for a lot of people. They think, oh, level 3A, that must be better than 3, but it's not. It's less protection. That being said... Let's dig into this delicious stew that is body armor levels. Realize what's kind of become the de facto authority on this is the NIJ. And I don't know why that is. Or I'm not even saying that you should care about that. But that's kind of the standard when you hear these terms. So, level 2. Tested to stop. 9mm and 357 Magnum ammunition fired from a short barrel handgun. Not rifle ammunition protected. Level 2A, tested to stop 9mm and 40 Smith & Wesson ammunition fired from a short barrel handgun, no rifle ammunition protection. Level 3A, tested to stop 357 SIG and 44 Magnum ammunition fired from a longer barrel, fired from longer barrel handguns, no rifle ammunition protection. Level 3, tested to stop 7.62 FMJ lead core rifle ammunition. Level 4, tested to stop 30 cal steel armor core piercing rifle ammunition. And again, there's no free lunch. You go up a lot in weight moving from some of these categories to the next. For in general use, for my guys for overt carry like plate carriers, I'm a big fan of level 3 or level 3 plus. Level 4 is quite a bit more weight, and it only really stops a few niche things. And it's possible you may encounter those things, but I don't think you're winning in that firepower versus mobility. You're getting quite a bit more weight for maybe you're going to run into green tip. And again, that stuff can be quite a bit bigger and bulkier than comparable stuff in level 3 or level 3 plus. So that's where I sit on that. Talking about soft body armor, you're likely talking about handgun rounds. I'd say get one that stops by far your most common rounds. 9, 40, 45, 22. Those are by far, talking about a market share, the most common rounds. Those are my thoughts on body armor. For what it's worth, you may disagree. There's new stuff on the market all the time. Maybe there's stuff that I'm not even aware of. First body armor I was given was a flak jacket. Try and step with all this cool modern hip stuff. The hipster tactical market with the multicam and everything. And maybe I overlooked something. Maybe I left something out, omitted something, not intentionally, but I just wasn't aware of it. You can contact me, questions, concerns, comments at goodshepherdtraining.com. If you think this content, if you're looking at buying any of this stuff, it's probably going to cost you more than five bucks. You might want to consider going over to Patreon. A quick aside, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a way for you to say, hey, I appreciate what you're doing, sir. I value your time that you're giving me to explain this to me. I would like to help. And you go over to Patreon and step up. If you think that's something you should do, then go to Patreon. And if not, don't and don't feel guilty about it. That's what Patreon is. And it's not just you giving me money to do the show, which I think that should be the main reason because you think it's worth it. But Patreons get a lot of cool insider stuff on there. Go to Patreon. You'll see some things just are available to the public. You can see and you'll see a lot of hidden posts. A lot of that I hope is valuable information for patrons. Anyway, if you want to do that, you can get there via goodshepherdtraining.com or there should be a Patreon link directly in the show notes. With that, the tactical tip of the day. If you're going to run a battle belt, I mentioned that inner belt and that outer belt. You're going to need something called belt keepers. That's a dead giveaway to me if you show up to some kind of tactical training that you never really done this before if you don't have belt keepers. You need to run belt keepers. 
Simple, if you don't have them, you can literally make them out of 550 cord. And sometimes if we forgot them, we would. See, like police, they'll have these, are like leather snaps, or basically just a small leather belt that snaps on to attach their outer belt to their inner belt. You should have these. Again, you can make these out of 550 cord if you know a bolo knot or a slip knot or a hitch knot. But you can get them, and of all the money you're spending on kit and body armor, they're not that expensive. Have some keepers. Maybe have some extra ones weaved into your molly. If you've forgotten your keepers, keepers are important if you're doing that tactical dynamic movement. War belt doesn't end up around your rib cage or something. Or, likely when you're sprinting from place to place shooting, you go to draw your gun and now your holster is either directly in front of your crotch or directly behind your back because your whole belt has shifted. That's what those keepers do. They keep it in place. Again, if you're not just standing in your living room looking cool with the kit, if you're actually using it, you're going to want keepers. Don't skimp on the keepers. Have them have a couple of extra ones and something I like to do for all manner of applications wrapped around my war belt when I was doing this professionally. A piece of 550 cord wrapped around there, same color as the belt, several feet of it, comes in handy for a lot of things if you forgot your keepers. Also really handy for throwing a quick bowl of knot in there and throwing over door handles to open doors without getting shot in the face, which I'm a big fan of. There's a bad guy in there trying to kill you. As soon as he sees that door start to open, where do you think he's going to shoot? At that opening door. So don't be there. Anyway, some tactical tips. Tactical verse of the day. I know I've mentioned this one several times, but I'm going to mention it again because it's a good one. Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. With that, men, thanks for listening. I hope you never need body armor. But if you do, I hope this helped. Have a blessed day.